Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. You know, some people, they're like the lost son. Other people, they're like the lost sheep. And then there's some people that are like the lost coin. They have no awareness of their lost state. Hi, I'm Bayless Conley. In life, we all face uncertainty. Whether it's financial troubles, relationship valleys, a health crisis, or just trying to discover your purpose, one thing is for certain, God sees you, He loves you, and no matter what you're facing, He has the answers. All right, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Him to hear Him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. It says in verse 3, So he spoke this parable to them, saying, Now to them means to the Pharisees and to the scribes that were murmuring, but it also includes the tax collectors and the sinners that had drawn near to hear him speak. And I want you to notice it said he spoke this parable to them. It's singular. And then he goes into the three different parts of the parable. They're actually not separate parables in this chapter. They're like three different panels of the same parable, three different phases, three different parts of the same parable, if you would. And we need all of them. The first one deals with the lost sheep, the second the lost silver, and the third part deals with the lost son. Now, you know, the sheep and the coin did nothing to aid in their retrieval or in their rescue. It was the shepherd that went after the lost sheep and found it, and actually the sheep didn't even walk back. He carried it back. It was the woman that went after the lost coin. that They did nothing to help in their rescue, and that reveals to us the sovereignty of God in salvation. But with the lost son, the father waited, and it was the son who came seeking the father revealing man's free will in salvation. And salvation is the result of both the sovereignty of God and man by his free will responding to what God offers. And if we just take the, the first part or the first and second part of the parable and not the third part, we don't get the whole picture. If we just take the third part about the prodigal son and we leave out the first two parts, we don't get the whole picture. They're all connected together. Now the shepherd that goes after the lost sheep shows the work of Jesus in salvation. He is the good shepherd to, that came to seek and to save that which was lost. The woman that lights the lamp and searches after the coin in her home shows the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation, for it is the Holy Spirit that brings illumination. And the Father, of course, shows the work of the Father in salvation. The Trinity, all involved in reaching the lost. In fact, it is their paramount, or paramount um, issue and work, and it is their highest joy, reaching lost people. So let's look at the part of the parable that deals with the lost coin. Verse 8, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I just want to share with you thoughts about this part of the parable dealing with the lost coin. Number one, the coin had no awareness of being lost. Now, the son was lost willfully, deliberately, and consciously, the prodigal son. The sheep, those sheep, as Joel talked about last time, are pretty stupid animals. The sheep most likely knew it was lost. It would have had a vague idea that it was without the companionship of the flock and the care of the shepherd. But the coin being without life, had no consciousness, no sense of being lost, 
and it felt no anxiety concerning its lost state. And you know, some people, they're like the lost son. Other people, they're like the lost sheep. And then there's some people that are like the lost coin. They have no awareness of their lost state. No anxiety over the fact that they are lost to God or their impending future when they step into eternity. Yet in the story, God is diligently and carefully working to bring even the lost coin people to salvation. How is he doing that, you ask? He's doing it by the Holy Spirit working through his church, which is represented by the woman searching for the coin in the house. And as she searches for this lost coin, this woman that represents the Spirit working through God's people, she does two things. Everybody say two things. Number one, she sweeps with a broom. And that broom represents the gospel. God uses the gospel to awaken people's conscience. The scripture says this in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The Bible says in Romans 10 and 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And then it says in verse 17 of that same chapter, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Another translation says faith is awakened by hearing the word. Another translation says faith is birthed by hearing the word. God uses the message to awaken people's conscience. It is the power of God to salvation, but if they don't hear the message, they cannot believe. I mean, the first time the gospel broom came into my life was when that 12-year-old kid told me about Jesus in the park. I was messed up on drugs, all sorts of problems. And you know, in less than a year, after a number of months, that, that gospel broom had swept away all the wrong thinking and all the lies that I had believed. And it brought me into a relationship with Christ. We need to use the gospel broom. We need to preach the gospel. How can they believe in him in whom they've not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? Faith is awakened. Faith comes alive by hearing and hearing by the word. But you know, this woman, before she used the broom, before she swept, she did something else. And this is the second thing. She lit the lamp. That symbolizes illumination from the Holy Spirit. And that comes when we pray. Before we sweep, we should light the lamp. Before we share, we should pray. We should talk to God about men before we talk to men about God. Ephesians 1 and 18, Paul prayed that the eyes of people's understanding would be enlightened. And I think it's important that we pray God will reveal himself to people, that the truth of the gospel would dawn upon them. And I'll guarantee you there are specific people in your personal world that you should be praying such a prayer for people that you work with, some, some colleagues in the office or, you know, on the construction side or in the school or wherever you work, maybe neighbors you have, maybe relatives. And you and I should be earnestly praying, God, open their eyes. Let them see who you are. Let the reality of who you are dawn upon them. Pray that illumination will come to them. And then we can use the broom, and we can sweep. And you know, I think we should also pray that the Holy Spirit would illuminate us and guide us concerning direction in our search, where we should be searching, and how we should be using the broom for that matter. So her light in the lamp, yes, it's illumination for others, but it's for us as well. You know, there's needs all around us, all the time. There are people, I guarantee you, there are people in your world, at your office, on your street, that you might never guess it. They're at their wit's end. They're at the end of their rope. And they're saying, God, if you're real, show me. If you're real, help me. 
And God's looking for someone to be an answer to that prayer. All right? Second thought I want to share with you is this. We'll call it engaging the women. You know, Jesus, he made this switch from a lost sheep to a lost coin, and he did that to engage the women. He started talking about a shepherd and lost sheep, and that was man's work in that day in that culture. Women were not shepherdesses. I mean, when they talked about this guy leaves the 99 sheep and traipses around in the wilderness, no woman would have been doing that, wandering around in the wilderness by herself. That was something that a man did in that culture. But suddenly Jesus switches and starts talking about a coin that's lost in the house, and every woman there would have immediately related to the story. And the fact that in the parable, the Spirit is using a woman to light the lamp and to sweep shows God's desire to use the girls. Women, listen, we need you. We are at a huge disadvantage without you if you don't play your part in God's master plan. God wants to use the girls. Psalm 68 and verse 11 says, the Lord gives the command. The women who proclaim the good tidings are a great host. Another translation says the Lord gave the command and many women carried the news. All right, why women? Because God has given you an incredible ability to influence and to persuade. And you can do it without trying to act like a man. Think about the woman of Samaria that Jesus met at the well. With just a few words, he persuaded an entire city to consider Jesus, which resulted in their wholesale conversion a short time later. Now listen, this is speaking strictly from a male perspective. Ladies, you are intriguing. You're fascinating. You're mysterious. You're unfathomable. You're hard not to look at. You're magnetic. You're motivating. You have influence. You are wondrous, you're attractive, you're appealing, you're capable, you're significant, you're persuasive, you're engaging, you're frightening, you're adorable, <laughs> you're captivating, you have influence. You're amazing, you're enchanting, you're remarkable, you're extraordinary, you're puzzling, you're habit-forming, you have influence. You're astonishing, you're beautiful, you're mind-blowing, you're unique, you're baffling, and you're spellbinding. You have influence. You are the pinnacle of God's creation, the finest example of his artistic genius. You have influence. So let your light shine. We need you. You can change the world if you'll become a carrier and a conduit of the good news. God wants to use the girls. And Jesus engaged the women in his story. All right, the third thought about this is that the coin was lost in the house. It was lost in the house. Now, the prodigal son was lost in a far country. The sheep was lost in the wilderness, but the coin was lost in the house. And we need to travel far and reach out in areas that are not our native land but we also need to reach out to the lost who are nearest to us where we live and where we labor. Maybe you are the lost coin in the house, near physically but far off from God spiritually. He says, what are you doing, pastor? Just sweeping. Just trying to use the broom. You see, you can attend church regularly and be lost. Church attendance does not make you a Christian. You can be sincere and you can be lost. You can be religious and you can be lost. Jesus said you must be born again. All right, fourth thought I want to share with you is we need community. Everyone say community. You know, the sheep was restored to the shepherd, but he was also restored to the flock. The coin was restored to the woman, but it was also restored to the other nine coins. The son 
was restored to the Father, but also restored to the fellowship of the house. God's plan is to save us and then make us a part of a believing community. The Bible says in Psalm 68 and verse 6, God sets the solitary in families. Our church family is so important. First, for our spiritual growth. The Bible says the body grows by that which every joint supplies. Psalm 92 and verse 13 says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. You need what others have. I need what others have. And others need what you have and what you can supply. They need your perspective. They need your strength. Second reason it's important is for safety. You know, I watch a lot of uh, animal shows, you know, African, you know, animals or what, whatever it might be. Watch a lot of shows about fish in the ocean, and I just love those sort of National Geographic type things. And you'll notice if you watch those or you know anything about it, whether it's a pride of lions hunting, whether it's a pack of wild African dogs or hyenas that are hunting their prey, an impala or whatever it is, they always endeavor to separate and isolate their prey from the safety of the herd. The devil always wants to separate and isolate. When we're separated and isolated, we are vulnerable. In fact, being isolated leads to bizarre thinking. Proverbs 18.1, he that isolates himself rages against all wise judgment. The devil always wants to separate us so he can take advantage of us. And I know some people say, well, I don't go to church because church people offended me. It's going to happen. I mean, you think about in the story. This coin is lost because the woman lost it. The way she had handled or mishandled the coin. She even admitted the coin that I lost, the piece I lost. And so, you know, the Spirit is actually using the one that lost the coin to find the coin. God only has an imperfect church, especially if you're part of it. <laughs> especially if I'm part of it. There's only imperfect people. We're going to rub shoulders. There's going to be differences of opinion. Occasionally, somebody's going to say something or do something that you do not like. God's created us that we need community. It's important. It's God's idea. Here's the fifth thought, the value of the coin. You know, the woman searched diligently as if she had no other coins. The shepherd left the 99 sheep in the wilderness to go after the one. The father wasn't just content because he had one son that didn't want to leave home. His heart yearned over his lost son. God so loved the world, but he's interested in the one. He's interested in you. He's interested in your story. And he will move heaven and earth to reach one, to reach you. God doesn't see crowds. He sees individuals. You are never some faceless person in a sea of humanity to God. You are never some number on an endless list to God. God sees individuals. And we have the stories, you know, with Christ and the multitudes, to be sure. But far more time is devoted to the Scriptures to the story of Jesus with individuals, with blind Bartimaeus, with Jairus, with a Roman centurion whose servant was sick, with a Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was possessed, with a woman at the well, with a possessed man who lived among the tombs, with a woman caught in the act of adultery, with Peter's mother-in-law, with a man with a withered hand, with a man that was born blind who was kicked out of the synagogue, Far more time is given to Jesus with individuals than Jesus with the multitudes. 
Individuals are important to God. You know, there's an amazing story in Genesis 16 about Hagar. She was Sarah's serving girl. And Sarah couldn't get pregnant, so she decided to use Hagar as a surrogate. So she told her husband, Abraham, look, I want to give you my maidservant. You go into her, and we'll have a baby that way. And and there's no record that Abraham uh, argued at all. (laughs) He just thought it was a splendid idea, acted upon it immediately. Hagar gets pregnant. And Sarah begins to treat her badly. Hagar runs away, and she ends up out in the wilderness. You think about it. She's a young, probably teenage girl. She's been thrown into circumstances beyond her control. None of this was her choosing. And now to her, it seems like her life is going to be hard and miserable from now on. All she sees is a bleak future. And she's out, she finds this spring of water in the wilderness, and she's either sitting on a rock, laying there crying, and suddenly an angel from God appears and speaks to her, talks to her about the child in her womb. The angel tells her the future of that child, what he's going to do, what he's going to accomplish, and then gives her specific instructions of what she needs to do in this critical hour, tells her exactly what to do, And the woman says to the angel, and she names the place. She says, I give this place the name Bir Lahairoi, which means well of the living one who sees me. He sees me. He sees me in my pain. He sees me in my confusion. He sees me in my frustration. He sees me. My friend, he sees you. Not just a mass of people, he sees you. You have more value than you know to God. You know, I have a friend that years ago, he worked with Reinhard Bonnke and was on Bonnke's team for quite a few years. And this is a long time ago, back when Bonnke had smaller meetings of about 100,000. He was doing outside crusades and they were running about 100,000 at the time. They grew to where he was doing meetings with with more than a half a million present. In fact, beyond that, but uh, still, these enormous crowds. And my friend said, Reinhard did something really odd. There's this sea of people out there, and he stops in his message and says, there's someone out here named John. It's like, duh. (laughs) There's like a thousand Johns out there, maybe more. He just says, there's someone out here named John, and God has heard you, John, and then goes back to his message. Anyway, my friend is working with all the people that that responded to the invitation. You know, thousands got saved. And it just happened, one of the individuals that he was dealing with in the the follow-up is just just shattered. He's broken up and he's crying. And he tells this story. He says, my mother made me come. It was a young man. He says, then I told her this whole thing is fake. The whole thing is fake. There's nothing to it. The only way that I'll know that God is real is if that man calls my name from the stage. His name, John. What can you say? God knows how to speak your heart language. You may not have an experience like that one, but God can speak to you in a way that you know It is God, and that you know that he sees you. You have value. I honestly don't know how God can do it, but he sees everyone and everything, everywhere at the same time. And he's able to give individual attention to everyone at the same time. He loves us. He knows us. He knows you. He knows your inner struggle. He knows your inward questions. He knows what makes you happy. He knows what makes you sad. And he has plans for your life. Let me pray with you right now. And Maybe you've never opened your heart to Jesus. Will you pray with me? Just say, oh God. Maybe even say it out loud. Oh God, I come to you right now. 
I believe that you are real and that your son is Jesus Christ. I believe you sent him to rescue me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sins. Right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life for I believe you have been raised from the dead. Jesus, I give you my all. In your name, I pray. Now, if you prayed that prayer, please contact us. We would love to hear from you. In fact, just to hear that the broadcast has been a blessing to you, it encourages our hearts so much. And I just want to finish by saying thank you to those that have been partners with us in supporting this broadcast. We couldn't do what we do. We couldn't go where we go if not for people like you that faithfully and consistently give and pray for this ministry. God bless you in Jesus' name. We have a daily email devotional that I believe can be of great benefit to you. You know, when we take God's word in every day, it helps us become established in the Lord. Make room in your daily schedule for God's word by signing up for Bayless's devotionals, available on your phone, tablet, or PC. Take time to sow the seeds of God's word into your life every day with this free email devotional. If you don't have a copy of my daily devotional, Answers for Each Day, I'd like to encourage you to get one. It's a way to help discipline yourself to get some of the Word of God into your heart every day. And you know the scripture says that the inward man is renewed day by day. Jesus said man doesn't live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So you can get your daily spiritual bread, at least part of it, by reading that daily devotional every morning or every night. I give some thoughts. We share a bit on, on different scriptures and, and principles from the Bible. It'll be a blessing to you. Use the information on the screen to get your copy of Bayless Conley's devotional book, Answers for Each Day, for the special price. Start each day by focusing on God's truth and building a stronger faith in God.